Hey, this is Robin. Okay, very good. So we're so glad to welcome Dr. Birgit Shula today. She is an associate professor in the Department of Pathology at Stanford, and she received her medical training in Germany and uh, later on did a uh, study genetics in, for the inherited forms of Parkinson's disease and dystonia. And, and, uh, and later on, she did some training with that and then later on completed a postdoc, in fact, at, in human genetics with, at Stanford University. And she was at the Parkinson's Institute and Clinical Center leading research there for many, many years. And we're so glad to have her at Stanford and glad to have her with us today to talk about alpha-synuclein uh, possible targets um, with Parkinson's disease. So take it away, Dr. Shula. And I'm going to turn off my video and just have yours. And I'll keep track of all of the uh, questions and uh, chats that come in. And if anybody has questions, just use the question box or the chat box, and I'll, um, I'll ask the questions as we go along. Thanks so much. Wonderful, thank you, Robin. Thanks so much for the invitation to have me um, at your support group speaking today. I believe I, I did that about 10 years ago when I was still at the Parkinson's Institute. So I'm, I'm glad to be back, unfortunately, not in person yet, but, uh, but hopefully soon. So it's, um, it's my real pleasure to, um, to present challenges and, and possibilities of alpha synuclein lowering strategies really as, a, as, as, as their, uh, therapeutic um, options. So as Robin said, I've been working on genetic forms of Parkinson's disease and specifically on, on alpha-synuclein over the last 15, G, 15 years, um, um, studying the pathophysiology um, of overexpression of alpha-synuclein in human stem cell models. And we are also developing um, transgenic models and gene therapy models for uh, gene recognition. So um, this is just an overview of what I'm uh, talking to you today about. Um, um, first of all, I want to introduce um, alpha-synuclein as a therapeutic target. Um, then um, I want to discuss what are the different therapeutic concepts for targets, targeting alpha-synuclein. What are the challenges and, and also what are the potential um, next breakthroughs? So here's the suspect. Yeah? So alpha-synuclein is also known as, as PARC1 or PARC4, lives on chromosome 4Q2.1. And it's a, it's a relatively um, small guy, only 140 amino acids or uh, 14 kilodaltons. Um, a, a much larger protein that you know in the Parkinson's disease field is uh, LARC2. And that protein is almost 20, 20 times bigger than of synuclein. Um, although synuclein is not less, less trouble. <laughs> Um, Alpha-synuclein comes as a monomer, so one molecule, but also then um, aggregates um, into oligomers or um, fibrils. And the aggregation is really what we believe um, uh, causes Parkinson's disease. There have been uh, some mutations that you see here, and there are also changes um, in, uh, in the protein that are called post-translational modifications um, that are seen in pathological forms of alpha-synuclein and also in Lewy bodies. So I think first, since I'm a geneticist, I want to uh, uh, walk you through some uh, genetic con concepts of alpha-synuclein. So first um, are the point mutations, and those were first discovered in 1997. Um, in a large um, a kindred from um, Italy and, and Greece. And then soon thereafter, um, in the same year, it was shown that alpha-synuclein is also a major component of Lewy bodies. And re that really um, established the whole um, concept that alpha-synuclein uh, might be a, a good target for Parkinson's disease. So here you see alpha-synuclein staining in human brain and the brown um, 
um, color here, this is alpha cell nuclein. In this case, it is alpha cell nuclein that is post-translationally modified um, at, a, at a certain position. And so this is from a brain, um, from a patient who had actually um, four copies of alpha cell nuclein. Just here to illustrate what I mean when I talk um, about point mutations. So point mutation means that there's just one building block in, uh, in the genomic sequence that has been changed. And that's causing the protein to, uh, to aggregate more readily and, uh, and cause uh, neurodegeneration. The frequency of these point mutations in um, familial and sporadic disease is uh, pretty low. It's only about 0.5%. Um, and there have been only very few mutations, um, this type of mutations described. Um, but again, these mutations cause Parkinson's disease by increasing um, the propensity to, to aggregate and then ultimately form new bodies. And could you just clarify, uh, Dr. Shula, mm -hmm. the between uh, alpha synuclein and Lewy bodies? And and also explain that uh, some that we call uh, Parkinson's disease Lewy body disease. So um, I the question is related to the clinical categorization. Is, is no, uh, so so uh, what is in a Lewy body? It's alpha synuclein that's misfolded. That's correct. It's not just alpha synuclein, but it's a major component. There are many, many other proteins, also other cell organelles um, that come, come together um, that, um, that form Lewy bodies. Um, but alpha synuclein, as you see here, um, can, yeah, is, is, is basically the hallmark of these Lewy bodies. Okay, and we call, uh, we can call Parkinson's disease, a Lewy body disease. That's correct. When we look at the brain of people who have died and we they've gone to autopsy, we can say that they have Parkinson's disease because we see Lewy bodies in their brains. That's correct. Okay. And, and they're also, they're also, I mean, it, that, that's a whole different uh, talk, basically, um, the way um, they are, they are formed, the way they are located, not just in certain cell types, but also in certain brain regions. Um, yeah, so that is, um, yeah, there's a whole um, spectrum where you can find these Lewy bodies in, uh, in the brain. Okay, very good. I okay. think sometimes lay people think that Lewy bodies means hallucinations and delusions. Oftentimes people will say, oh, my family member has Parkinson's disease with Lewy bodies. When they, when they really mean to say, uh, my family member has Parkinson's disease and it includes hallucinations and delusions. So it was just yeah. a clarification about what Lewy yeah. bodies means. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you. Very good. Yeah, no, I understand. It's a, it's 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 a lot of um, very difficult um, uh, terminology that I'm bringing up, and I'm trying to be simple. But sometimes, as a scientist, you're just so nerdy, you don't even have <laughs> simple <laughs> words for these things. I'm sorry. <laughs> you are nerdy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so stop me anytime. We 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 have. I think we have enough time. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, all right. Um, so uh, going to part two of alpha synuclein genetics, I just told you that um, individual point mutations, so changes of just one building block in a gene can cause Parkinson's disease. But here, I wanted to introduce to another concept called copy number mutations or copy number variants. Um, those are much larger regions in, in the genome. And here on the right, you see a picture of um, a large chromosome. So, um, uh, and this is the address of um, alpha synuclein chromosome four. And then down here um, in these red and also blue um, bars, um, you see the size of these large, um, larger genomic regions. 
And those were discovered in 2004 as a cause for Parkinson's disease. These multiplied regions, duplications or triplications can um, include many genes. But what has been seen is when you just look at the common denominator here, um, the gene that's underlying this part is only alpha nuclein. So from, from these studies and in these families, we found that too much of the normal or wild type alpha nucleon can cause Parkinson's disease. You might wonder what these uh, green bars are, and I'll tell you in a couple slides. Those are individuals who have deletions of this region. So we have, when you have too much, there's also a possibility to, uh, to have too little of alpha nucleus, And that's also quite interesting also for the um, therapeutic development. And then lastly, um, my part three of alpha nucleus genetics are non-coding changes of the genome or non-coding variants. So those genetic changes are not within alpha synuclein, but very close. Um, they're listed here and they have these uh, numbers and uh, they don't really change the, um, the protein or um, yeah, the, 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 the folding of the gene, but it might increase risk and it might alter alpha synuclein expression. And um, some of those non-coding variants um, you might find in reports that you might have gotten from um, consumer-based genetic testing like, like 23andMe. Um, so these, these variants are reported in those um, tests. Okay, so just um, um, the overall concept of alpha synuclein pathology in um, Parkinson's disease, we're starting with the um, normal or native form of alpha synuclein. And then um, through mutations or just by having too much synuclein, um, it can change um, its, its formation and, uh, and get into misfolded proteins also can build oligomers so that multiple um, proteins of alpha synuclein really kind of get stuck together. And then um, another phase are um, fibrils. So these are just diff different, different ways um, to, to describe um, of, uh, aggregated alpha synuclein. So um, because these misfolded proteins can't do their normal function anymore, they get degraded in the cell or recycled. And there are different ways to do that in the lysosomes. And I'll talk about lysosomal function later in the talk. And there's also the proteasomes. So those are two recycling systems in the cell. The other thing that's interesting is, and that has been described about 10 years ago, that alpha synuclein can also get secreted um, from cells and then transmit it into, uh, into other neurons or um, glia cells, so other cells of the uh, nervous system. And then down here, you see that these um, aggregated forms of alpha synuclein can lead to all kinds of different uh, problems in the cell. So it can um, cause synaptic dysfunction, mitochondrial dysfunction, also changes in this lysosomal autophagy system. So um, once, once you have this disease process um, going, um, it really affects all kinds of different um, uh, organelles in the cell. And we have a question, uh, Dr. Shula, which is, is alpha synuclein in the brain normal? Yes, yes, it is normal. Um, it is uh, a protein that I don't have, a, unfortunately, I don't have a reference, but um, word on the street is that about 1% of, of the protein in the brain is alpha synuclein. Um, the, the normal function is probably within, um, within synapses. So it's important for synaptic function, neurotransmitter release. Yes, it's very, very important. So it's important to keep, to keep a balance. 
Okay. So, so, so getting rid of alpha synuclein altogether is probably not a good idea. Okay. And someone asks if you're going to speak later about this transmission component. They're wondering if if um, if this means that uh, Parkinson's disease or some other disease of alpha synuclein, if if the Lewy bodies are spreading or secreting was the word you used, does that, it's a, like a prion disease Correct. where it spreads? Um, I will touch on that a little bit. Um, the second half of my talk is more about therapeutic strategies, not so much about disease mechanism, but I'll touch on that when I talk about the uh, immune and antibody therapies. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay, so uh, I just touched on this uh, briefly. Um, a big question is now when you think about um, reducing alpha say nuclein, and I, and I just uh, said that there is a normal, um, very important function for say nuclein, how much reduction of alpha say nuclein is actually beneficial? And um, and this is uh, something that I developed over the last um, few years. And you've seen that um, in my previous slide for the synuclein duplication and triplication. Um, I developed this uh, clinical spectrum of alpha synuclein gene dosage, so gene or gene copy numbers. Um, and what I've, what I've found is that when you have um, Here's the healthy control, and you have two copies of alpha synuclein. So everyone is expressing alpha synuclein. When you're increasing then the expression of synuclein, for example, with these alpha synuclein non-coding risk variants, that leads to idiopathic PD. When you have a duplication, that means you increase alpha synuclein by 50% or even with a triplication, you increase alpha synuclein by 100% and you have four copies of the gene. Um, you see this spec clinical spectrum that gets worse and worse. So from idiopathic PD um, to um, PD um, dementia, there are also some cases with multiple system atrophy reported. Um, to uh, dementia with Lewy bodies. So, so at that point, alpha synuclein is really spread throughout the brain um, and you find Lewy bodies um, everywhere. So, 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 so that is one, um, one aspect. And when you see too much synuclein, you get uh, Lewy bodies. However, as a geneticist, I was always wondering what if when you have actually a deletion, um, so, um, yeah, through um, meiosis and, and, and um, yeah, um, cell division, these are things that can happen. And I was always thinking, okay, um, we want to lower alpha synuclein, so maybe there are healthy controls that have um, only one copy of alpha synuclein. And I looked in yeah, large genetic databases that you can uh, search. But what I actually found was um, a few years ago that there are cases um, that have alpha synuclein copy number variant deletions. And um, these are children with developmental delay um, and an autism spectrum disorder. So I thought that was um, pretty interesting. And um, that also tells me that getting rid of alpha synuclein altogether will possibly cause um, other problems. So we should be really cautious when we design um, strategies for alpha synuclein down regulation. So now, what are the different concepts, the therapeutic concepts of lowering alpha synuclein? And I'll go through um, all six here. So one is the alpha synuclein um, production. And so this is the reduction of the production, the lowering of alpha synuclein aggregation. I told you when you have aggregated synuclein, you see all these um, changes in the cell and a cell death. 
Another strategy would, uh, would be to increase the recycling system of the cell. So um, make these lysosomes work harder to degrade um, aggregated alpha synuclein and also reducing extracellular alpha synuclein. Um, then um, I'll touch a little bit about the um, alpha synuclein uptake and what receptors there are. And um, another strategy, and that's a specific genetic form, is to increase um, this enzyme called GCH, which is also a lysosomal enzyme. So and it fits in this category, but um, it's found in, um, in patients that have mutations in a specific gene called GBA which is encoding this enzyme called GCase. So first off, reducing the production of alpha synuclein. The rationale here is if the uh, production of alpha synuclein can be prevented, then less protein is produced and all the uh, yeah, toxic downstream effects can be avoided. And uh, I want to show um, this scheme to you, which is basically um, the central dogma of biology, which explains the flow of genetic information from the DNA to the mRNA. So M stands for messenger RNA, and then to um, a functional product um, of the gene, the protein. And these are the different therapeutic strategies that are currently um, yeah, under development. One is gene editing. Another uh, strategy are antisense oligonucleotides or ASOs. And then there are a number of small molecules and I show you one example um, that really targets these oligomeric forms of alpha synuclein. Um, to break them up so that alpha synuclein um, protein function can hopefully be regained. And then um, I'll talk about the antibody therapies that um, really target the extracellular alpha synuclein. And it's nicely really following the central dogma of, of biology and, and using those concepts. I think that is, uh, that's very exciting. So gene editing targets the um, DNA, and what it does is it, at the genomic level, can introduce permanent changes of the DNA, or it can make temporary changes to the DNA that allows to overexpress or repress the production um, of the RNA. So the idea is if you make changes here, you're reducing the mRNA and then the, uh, the, the product of the gene, the alpha synuclein protein. And then hopefully all of these downstream um, problems will not occur. So one example for that um, are CRISPR, um, and they're also called molecular scissors for uh, gene engineering. And in this case, it is um, a lentiviral vector. So it's basically the shuttle or the taxi that takes um, um, the molecular scissor into, um, scissors into the cell. And in this case, it's not making changes directly to the, uh, to the DNA of the alpha synuclein, but it's introducing um, epi genetic changes that is uh, changing the alpha synuclein expression. And in this case, for this particular construct, it has been shown that in cells, when you're doing it in a Petri dish, so in vitro, it reduces alpha synuclein expression by about 30%. And then it rescues the function of dopaminergic nodes. 
And I just saw that um, this has been a recent report that for this particular construct, um, also in vivo, so in an animal model, in a preclinical model, a single dose of um, this vector can lead to 40% of alpha synuclein reduction. This has been put forward by, by a company called Silos Therapeutics. And um, in the, uh, the academic um, um, person who developed this is Dr. Siba Falek from Duke University. And um, in summer 2019, um, this um, idea and then the patent was licensed to Silos. And it's been developed since then. So it's a very um, promising, um, interesting uh, strategy. Challenges are here. Um, we don't know so much about these molecular scissors yet and uh, what, they, what they do long-term um, when you have them expressed in the brain. And Dr. Shula, is the yeah. idea then for, to give people with Parkinson's disease in early stages or to give, you know, to find prodromal Parkinson's disease cases and give them some therapy that will eliminate the alpha synuclein gene expression? Or what's the, what's the thinking here? Yeah, that's that's a good question, um, and and that's that's one of the challenges of um, of clinical trials that you're touching um, in general, um, because Parkinson's disease as a progressive disorder, you're losing neurons over time. So when you're when you're, for example, using using this strategy in a late um, late stage patient, it might not do much because um, the the neurons are gone. So you're right, you probably want to start as early as possible um, with this strategy. Yeah. Thank you. So the next uh, stage here is uh, the mRNA. And uh, I call this shooting the messenger, um, quite literally. So what the, the strategy is to use um, um, small complementary uh, molecules to the mRNA or messenger RNA of alpha synuclein. And then these molecules bind to um, alpha, alpha synuclein mRNA and basically destroy the mRNA through the cellular machinery and, and certain enzymes can basically just chew it up. And again, here is the, the idea is if the messenger RNA is gone, no protein can be produced and none of the downstream problems occur. This, this strategy has been followed by um, a company called Ionis. And as I said, these are synthetic strands of um, nucleic acid that can modulate gene expression and basically kill um, the messenger. These ASO therapeutics have been recently FDA approved for um, other diseases. Um, one is spinal muscular atrophy or SMA and also for Duchenne muscular dystrophy or DMD. Um, so that's a really good sign because it has shown um, efficacy in clinical trials in, in people um, for um, yeah, ameliorating and um, um, yeah, improving function. So what it does is it also reduces the uh, selective production of alpha synuclein in midbrain neurons. And down here, you see a study in primate brain and also in the CSF of primates that these ASOs here in um, um, pink and blue show a reduction in alpha synuclein protein. So that's really exciting. And um, also this strategy is now um, approved for a clinical trial 
for multiple system atrophy. And in this case, it is an injection um, directly into um, yeah, the cerebrospinal um, cavity. So it's called an intrafecal injection. And you can see here um, this product or this ASO is uh, from Ionis is partnered with Biogen. So um, there's a lot of weight behind that this is uh, moving to the clinic if, um, if the clinical trial is positive. So the next strategy is reducing the aggregation of alpha synuclein. And the rationale is if the aggregation of synuclein can be prevented, then its normal function can be um, restored or sustained. And um, yeah, the toxicity of the misfolding of synuclein can be avoided. And so here um, we are targeting not the normal form of alpha synuclein, but the oligomers that are causing the problem. And again, by reducing um, the oligomers and getting them into the, the normal monomeric form, um, we will avoid all these downstream um, problems. Um, this small molecule is called ANLE138B. And um, interestingly enough, um, I heard about this compound about 10 years ago when I did a sabbatical um, in Germany. So this is coming out of a Max Planck Institute. And um, I remember discussions about the small molecules and uh, how to get funding from the Michael J. Fox Foundation and so on. So I'm, I'm really excited to see that um, um, this compound has been kind of moved through the ranks of preclinical testing. It's now in a, um, yeah, at a company and it's developed and uh, it's, uh, it's also now in a in a clinical, um, yeah, tested in clinical trial. So what it does, it does is it binds to oligomers and um, alters those and modulates them from um, the toxic oligomers to the non-toxic oligomers and monomers of alpha synuclein to really restore and regain the normal function of the protein. What it doesn't do is it doesn't touches the fibrils. So it's not a fibril breaker, um, but only the smaller forms of, um, uh, of the oligomers. And also here I found online um, late October, um, there's a press release that uh, this company Modak in Germany is now a partner with Teva um, for further collaboration for a clinical development, which is really quite exciting. So um, the next strategy is um, increasing the degradation of alpha synuclein. And as I've shown before, autophagy or lysosomal function plays a major role in degradation or the recycling of alpha synuclein aggregates. So the idea is to enhance these autophagic uh, processes, which then leads to increased degradation of the pathological forms of alpha synuclein. And there are several examples in the literature that also have been tested in clinical trials, rapamycin, trehalose, and natural sugar. And then um, this compound, MSDC160 um, um, in Grand Rapids, so it's a modulator of um, um, a mitochondrial um, protein. The challenges for all of these um, compounds is that they really lack um, specificity for alpha synuclein and also um, affects um, other essential pathways. 
There also have been some uh, side effects like immunosuppression um, reported. So um, while they have been around, it's been um, really difficult to, um, um, to use them for a specific um, um, alpha synuclein um, um, targeting approach. Another um, enzyme that is important for lysosomal and autophagic function um, is called GCAs. And the GCAs enzyme is um, encoded by um, a gene called GBA. And uh, some of you might know that GBA mutations can increase the risk for Parkinson's disease um, by about 20 fold. And we find GBA mutations in about seven to 10% of patients with Parkinson's disease. GBA encodes this lysosomal enzyme called GCAs or beta glucoserbosidase. And what it does is it also degrades and recycles uh, lipids alpha synuclein directly, but other lipids. So what you see is you have a decrease in um, GCA's activity, lysosomal function. That means alpha synuclein doesn't get degraded as efficiently as it should, accumulates in the cell, and then, um, yeah, are found or, or, or gets further aggregated. In, uh, in Lewy bodies. What's also important to, uh, to know is that um, GBA mutations affect severity of, of, of Parkinson's disease. It reduces the age at onset um, for a few years. It seems to um, show a faster disease progression. And there is a higher likelihood of, um, of getting um, yeah, cognitive changes. So just here um, for the nomenclature, when I talk about GBA, I mean the gene and the GCAs is the gene product or the enzyme. So how can we restore the GCAs enzyme function? And some of you um, might have heard or have even been um, part of um, a recent trial um, by Sanofi that unfortunately failed. Um, and the idea here was to reduce basically the substrate of the GCA's enzyme. This failed earlier this year, I think in February was the press release um, that was very um, disappointing um, at the Parkinson's Institute when I was uh, working there, I was um, uh, helping recruiting patients for this trial. And I was very, very excited initially when this came up because it was really the first trial that was um, <clears throat> targeting a, um, a, a, a gene target. So, so, so this trial failed, but um, scientists are not giving up and it's good that there are <clears throat> multiple strategies follow. So the strategies that are currently um, under development is really the restoration of the um, enzyme function of the enzyme GCAs. And I'll show you um, one approach, which is a gene therapy approach and also approach an approach using small molecule um, chaperones. Enzyme replacement therapy, just giving GCAs back um, to a patient has not been that successful for um, Parkinson's disease because these enzymes don't really penetrate um, through the blood brain barrier. But later on, um, I'll show you there are some, some new ideas and some, some new strategies on um, how to actually shuttle um, also enzymes through the blood brain barrier. 
So there might be something new coming, coming here over the next few years. So GBA gene therapy um, is, um, is simple. So you want to just replace the gene. Um, the gene will then produce the enzyme and the enzyme can restore the normal function in the lysosome. Excitingly, there is a, a phase one to A first in human study under development. Um, to evaluate the safety of this administration. And here again, um, it's, it's called an intracisternal uh, administration of the, um, of the gene therapy. So what it means is um, the, the product has to be directly injected um, yeah, into the spinal um, cavity that here under the um, cerebellum. So that is called intracisternal injection. Patients um, that are eligible for this trial must have at least one GBA mutation. And um, the delivery vector or, or the shuttle that we're using here, the, the taxi, the cow, is, um, is called an AV9 viral vector to deliver that gene. The idea is to correct the lysosomal enzyme deficiency and restore um, normal function. Um, the clinical trial, um, you can look up here under clinicaltrials.gov, and it is an open-label open trial with 12 participants um, yeah, at uh, multiple sites throughout the US. Um, and then I wanted to uh, mention Ambroxol, um, which is a small molecule chaperone, which really um, makes sure it shuttles the GCH enzyme through the cell um, into the lysosomes, where um, it, it can perform its normal function. So by giving Ambroxol, it has been shown in, in um, in vitro and in vivo, so in, uh, in a test bed, um, that there is efficient transport um, of GCAs to the lysosomes. And there's also increased activity of the enzyme to rescue near degeneration. Ambroxol is um, an FDA approved drug. It's, you can, you can um, get it at the pharmacy and it's a cough medication. Currently, um, I'm very excited. I, I just looked that up. There are four clinical trials ongoing in the US, but also in Europe. And they're ongoing or completed uh, um, recruition, uh, yeah, recruiting patients and really testing the efficacy of amoxyl um, in Parkinson's disease, but also in uh, dementia with neurogotis. And would that again be for uh, PD patients who have one of the GBA, have one GBA mutation? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. I don't think so. In this case, um, what, I've, what I've read from these clinical trials, it is, uh, it's not gene specific. Um, so so all, basically an all comer um, trial. Or okay. And for, what about for, mm -hmm. what about the lay people out here who are saying, oh, well, okay, next time during the winter when I have a cough, I think I'll take Ambroxol. Uh, what would you say to that? Yeah, yeah, that, that's always a good question. And, and there, there are always these, um, yeah, news or press releases that, uh, yeah, they have been um, like Nilotinib was an example or there have been another asthma drug um, a few years ago. Um, I mean, nobody can prevent you from doing that. Um, on the other hand, um, as you see, a lot of these trials um, don't really show any effect. So um, you always have to see what are other side effects. I mean, there's a reason why we're doing clinical trials and not just giving it out. 
to everyone to, 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 to test for themselves. Um, clinical trials are, are controlled, they are blinded. Um, I, I would not um, suggest doing that. Um, okay. But, but, but again, I mean, nobody can kind of prevent you from, from doing it. So I think currently, um, and, and you, you can go to the clinical trials website, you can, you can even see um, how much um, these clinical trials administer um, to patients over how many, how many weeks um, and, and see those doses. Um, I mean, there's a reason why, we, why we're running clinical trials. It's still an experiment. It's, even though it's an approved drug, you, it won't kill you. It, it doesn't mean it really helps the Parkinson's disease. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but on the other hand, I also understand the urgency. Um, so it's, it, it, it's a fine balance and, um, and, and I, can, I can also see that patients say, I, I don't have anything to lose. Um, but as a researcher, I would do the experiment first before, um, yeah, getting to conclusions and, 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 and taking it. Okay. All right, so the next strategy is uh, reducing extracellular alpha-synuclein. And, and, the, and the big field there are the immunotherapies or antibody therapies. The idea here is to, um, to target the alpha-synuclein that, that's, that gets secreted, that's in the extracellular space, that's not in the cells, but uh, extracellular. Um, and, uh, and one strategy is to use um, antibodies. And then the, uh, there wouldn't be any more uptake uh, and propagation of, um, of the of synuclein pathology. So um, antibodies will not enter the cells. So you don't have antibodies that are intracellular, they're only extracellular. Um, in uh, in preclinical models, so in transgenic mice, um, it has nicely shown that it can reduce the aggregation of the same nuclein and really um, prevent and also um, ameliorate symptoms in, in these animal models. Um, it ha also has an anti-inflammatory effect in neurodegenerative models. So I'm not talking about um, uh, inflammation, Parkinson's disease, that's, um, that can be possibly another talk, um, but it also has those effects um, and those are positive effects. The problem is that um, it could also trigger off-target responses, um, non-specific inflammatory reactions, you have to repeat the administration of these antibodies potentially. Um, and the biggest challenge, and that's why um, it has gotten such bad press recently, there is really a limited penetration of these antibodies into the CMS. So they are not passing the blood brain barrier. And that has been um, really a challenge. So here from a paper published in Movement Disorders last year um, that shows completed phase one clinical trials really shows this uh, devastating low rate of um, penetration through the blood brain barrier for these, uh, uh, for these antibodies. And there is uh, one, this is the Biogen, um, I think this is the Profina antibody. I'm not sure which one this is, but it's very, very low. It's, it's, it's under 1%. And so it doesn't really get into, into the brain um, where, you, where you need the antibody to do its job. And um, because of that, and um, um, the clinical trial that um, didn't show any, any effect, um, Biogen, the um, pharma company, um, really discontinued um, the alpha synuclein antibody therapy um, kind of line, line of research and development. That was um, in a press release in February this year, and um, 
yesterday, um, just for fun, I went to the Biogen website and, and I searched for, for the for the alpha synuclein antibody name um, sin, uh, sinpanamab and um, there are no results. So, um, I mean, that shows me at least um, to, the, to the public, um, they show that they are not really following um, the antibody therapy strategy anymore. So they basically scrapped all of that. Very disappointing and, and maybe some of you have been have been part of this this clinical trial, um, but I mean I, I really thank everyone every patient who is so brave um, and and uh, participating in these trials. Um, thank you very much. Um, that's that's the ultimate proof um, if a uh, if a therapy works and has benefit. But I mean we we always have to also see that um, there can be no effect or um, um, there could be side effects. So thank you so much for every one of you who's participating in clinical trials. So <clears throat> as I said, it's, it's very difficult for, um, for a lot of these drugs to get through, getting through the blood-brain barrier. But recently there have been some, some strategies um, and they, um, the re researcher called them TVs or transport vehicles. Um, to get to get enzymes to get molecules through the blood brain barrier, and they did a trick. And what they did was they um, they used a um, uh, a part of of a protein that can actually bind to um, to receptors at the cell surface. So this is basically um, the front part of a, a semi-trailer semi um, truck. And then what you want to shuttle um, into the brain is, is then fused to it and basically attached. So you have to think about it really um, literally like a transport vehicle to get through. So the idea is that, that these um, fused um, um, drugs um, get, uh, get recognized by these receptors, taken up into the um, endothelial cells of the blood-brain barrier, and then literally shuttled through these um, the endothelial cells, and that gets um, secreted um, into, um, into the CSF, so basically into the brain. Um, that's the idea, and there have been now uh, um, several studies um, that have shown they, they can do that, for example, for enzymes, so for um, GCAs, um, that's, that could be um, an, op an option to get um, GCAs shuttled into the brain. Then <clears throat> the last strategy I wanted to talk about is the um, uptake or um, the reduction of cellular uptake of cytonuclein. At this point, there are no, um, not to my knowledge at least, um, uh, uh, no um, companies that have been following this. But the idea is that extracellular synuclein that can propagate between cells um, bind to cell surface receptors and, uh, and then really induce. Um, certain signals in the cell that can lead to cell death um, and, and, and other problems in the cell. So this is all very much a scientific jargon, but these are all the, all the issues that, that this could, um, could lead to. And um, these could be really new therapeutic um, avenues to modulate these receptors um, to inhibit the um, alpha synuclein uptake. Um, I just thought that's, uh, that's also an interesting strategy besides um, um, the antibody therapy. So in summary now, I think I convinced you that alpha-synuclein is a well-established therapeutic target for alpha-synuclein not just 
Parkinson's, but also um, Lewy body dementia and uh, multiple system atrophy. So um, all the neurodegenerative diseases where we see alpha synuclein aggregation. Um, I um, showed you different strategies from the DNA to the RNA to the protein to certain um, protein uh, to certain cellular functions um, to lower alpha synuclein and also to restore its function. I'm very, very excited that really some are already in clinical trials um, and show some um, um, good safety profiles and hopefully they will, um, they will be um, go further into phase two, phase three, and uh, hopefully get approved by the FDA at some point. Um, I have to say, I, I talked to um, Dr. Bill Langston a couple of days ago, and some, some of you might know he was the founder of the Parkinson's Institute. And um, it was just a, uh, a summit uh, from the Michael J. Fox Foundation on, on strategies of targeting alpha synuclein. And he was saying, Bigot, this is, this is so excited, exciting. 15 years ago, um, I, I hosted um, a similar summit on, on synuclein lowering strategies. And everyone who was there um, was, was really from, from, from universities, from, from the academic arena. And now everything has moved really into um, the, the commercial um, uh, part um, of yeah, the therapeutic development. And so companies are picking it up um, and getting it through clinical trials. And there is a true shift and um, that gives me hope that also shows that all the work that are putting into, into this, um, yeah, is, is, is yeah, coming to fruition. Um, there's still some challenges, but that's why we are, we're scientists and researchers and we're not giving up until we are done. <laughs> so we have to figure out the route of administration um, because some of these invasive strategies um, are, um, are not sustainable for, 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 for general or real life use. Um, passing the blood brain barrier, as I showed you, um, is another challenge, but there, there are new ideas that are coming through. Um, also the frequency of, of treatment. Um, can be can be a challenge. How often can you treat this, and how often is it possible to do this treatment, especially when you're when we're talking about gene gene therapies um, and uh, yeah, adding certain um, enzymes into into the human body that can cause certain side effects and um, yeah, immune reactions. Um, but that's why we're here, and that's why we're doing science. So thank you so much for your attention. Um, I hope you have a lot of questions. And um, um, down here, you see my, my email. You're welcome to also email, email me if you, if you have something later on you want to discuss. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Shula. I think that was a wonderful presentation. And uh, uh, I had a few questions. And if others have questions, please click the Q&A box. On my screen, uh, or the Q&A button, on my screen, the Q&A button is at the bottom, and there's also a chat button you could click. And again, on my screen, it's at the very bottom. And, and on some people's screens, it's under the more uh, tab or the more button, M-O-R-E, the three little horizontal dots. And if you click there, you might find the chat function if you don't see it on your screen. So a couple of questions um, pertaining to the, the three challenges you mentioned. Uh, one, you just talked about the frequency of treatment. And uh, do we have any idea how frequently, uh, has this been tested at all? How, how frequently one could get a, a virus vector with uh, some kind of uh, uh, an enzyme, uh, that's included in it. How, has that been tested at all? 
Yeah, so for, for some of those viruses, um, you have one shot because um, your body is, um, is also producing antibodies against those viruses because it's, it's something foreign that, that gets into your body. And then, um, I mean, luckily your immune system is, is, is ready to fight it. So um, yeah, for some of those strategies, you have one shot and it has to be the right amount in the right place. Um, for, for others, we don't know yet. Yeah. So for enzyme replacement, if it's, if it's the replacement without a virus, um, it can probably um, be administered multiple times, maybe every few months. I, I, I don't know. Mm -hmm. And are all of the um uh injections thus far into that uh into the cavity that you mentioned okay yeah yes yeah yes yeah. so, so some of them um i mean especially for gene therapy um with these um the the gdnf bdnf trials um you even have stereotactic um, surgeries into mm. the brain parenchyma yeah so for some of those um, that might be needed and right. um, that that in itself of course has um yeah has has its risk yeah brain surgery <laughs> yeah um okay another thing you mentioned uh, as one of the challenges was passing the blood brain barrier can you say a little bit about mm -hmm kinds of things are being used to try to address this because that one slide you showed was just very discouraging uh, the the three trials and how little had really passed through the blood brain barrier yeah that is um th that is very uh, disappointing um and 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 i'm not sure i mean though th those were concerns that people had all along um, but then um, I guess at some point when the train has left the station, um, you're just kind of going and, and saying, well, may maybe it's enough, maybe, maybe we'll see a benefit. So what are strategies? Um, um, there are for small molecules, you, you, can, um, you can change the chemistry um, for them to get through. Um, and then, as I said, for for larger molecules like antibodies or enzymes, um, you probably have to use uh, something that shuttles um, them through um, through the cell, through the blood brain barrier. Okay. Um, and again, if anybody has questions, uh, just click the question and answer box button or the chat button. Um, you mentioned, I think, is one of the challenges, the route of administration. What other things are being considered besides injection into the, that cavity? Yeah, I mean, for, for some of the um, viral vectors, um, uh, there has been also systemic injections. So just IV through vein, through the vein, um, that's another option. But then again, um, these vectors or viruses have to get through the blood brain barrier and, and not yeah. all of them do. Um, so, so some of these viruses, they really infect certain cell types. And since we want to um, make adjustments to neurons, most of those have an affinity to infect neurons. But then going through the blood brain barrier, that's that's their main challenge, not going through. Once they are through, they, they can in, infect neurons. So that is still um, a, a big challenge. Getting enough of, of your molecule, of your enzyme, of your um, yeah, vector to the right spot. So that's why you see in, when, when you have uh, these in vitro studies, so in, in cell culture or in animal models, um, things work surprisingly well. So mechanistically, mode of action is, is all correct. So as a scientist, we, we, we found the right thing, but just getting it there um, and, and yeah, 
having, yeah. a, having it do its, its, its job. That's, that's the challenge. It's right. Challenge. But, but in animal studies, you're still getting it past, do, and I assume other animals besides humans also have blood brain barriers. Yes. And the, the enzymes are still reaching uh, mouse brains or other, other mammal brains. Yeah, in these preclinical models, um, the route of administration oftentimes is it, it's, it's just a surgery. So because they want to show the proof of concept. I see. Okay. All right. We had a question from the audience that says, it sounds like the current trials include a small sample of patients. Is this just because the studies are in early stages? Yes, that's correct. So, so when, when you think about clinical trials, um, um, I mean, with every experiment, you want to start small. And first of all, in, in phase one of a clinical trial, you want to make sure um, a, a drug is safe. So you don't want to give that to um, 100 or 1,000 patients. You, you want to test that in a small number of, of healthy volunteers to see if there are any, any other side effects that you might not have seen in your preclinical studies in, in animals or in non-human, yeah, in mice or non-human primates. And then the next phase is the phase two, um, where you're actually going into the um, patient population of interest. And then you want to see how can you dose the drug? So how, how much is, uh, is needed? And when do you see an effect? And that's a strategy that, I mean, you do for, for, for any disease, for, for, for any trial you're doing. So you have phase one for safety. Uh, phase two, you want to show, um, is there an effect? So it's the efficacy trial. And then and in phase, phase three, then you're going in, into, into larger studies with more patients. But yeah, I mean, as, as a scientist and as, as a doctor, I mean, the first priority is to do no harm. And, and if, if, if you're doing these types of, of studies, it's, it's still an experiment in people. So you wanna be as careful and, and safe as possible. And there are, um, I mean, again, I, I think the, the brave people that um, register for clinical trials and, uh, and help move um, kind of yeah, new therapies forward. So um, thank you very much. So it's, it's still an experiment and sometimes the outcome we don't know. Um, yeah. you know the, the, the best indeed. possible. Yeah, indeed, the, while that one slide was disappointing in the results, it's fantastic that people participated in those trials, even if we had bad results, it, at least we got results and, and that's very important to yeah. Mm -hmm. and move forward. Yeah. Received another question, which is, can you inject perhaps that virus, viral vector or the enzyme itself, can you inject directly into the cerebral spinal fluid? Yeah, may maybe I wasn't clear. That, that's, that's what's actually happening. In that um, cavity yes, you're talking about. Exactly, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. That's, okay. that's correct. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I thought so. Mm -hmm. Thank you for clarifying mm -hmm. that. Um, but it's, as you know, not all of us are nerds like you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very sorry. It's, it's really, really hard. But it's... It is really hard. Yeah. <laughs> and and, and, and I, also, I also don't want to simplify things too much because then it gets fuzzy and, and unclear and, and yeah, and, and wrong sometimes. Of course. So, so. <laughs> yes, of course. Yeah, thank you. And I, I think you laid out those three strategies very well. Um, even though we might not have understood the details, we could get the, we could understand the, the title of the strategy. We could understand the concept if, if the details. So um, certainly uh, we welcome any other questions in the chat or the Q and A. And no question is a stupid question. Believe me, we, we, we're all in this uh, learning together along with Dr. Shula. Please uh, do, and, and, and really, I apologize if, if things really don't make sense, please. No, <laughs> it was, it was a, a very clear, very clear explanation, very clear presentation. Um, 
I wanted to ask, you had the one slide where you, I believe you described it as a slide that you had prepared that showed a graph mm -hmm. where there was a normal level of genes. I think you said that normal was two copies and then uh, there was a duplication and then a triplication. And then there was there were people on the other side that were child um, ch child onset autism or developmental difficulties. Yes. That strikes me as a, a fantastic opportunity to learn about them in hopes that it can help the people on the duplication or the triplication side. Are you involved in studying that population or other people studying that population specifically in terms of developing some alpha synuclein related therapy? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you're um, that 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 goes really close to my heart. I mean, that's that's something that I really would like to um, explore further. Um, unfortunately, um, those families are very, very rare in those uh, yeah those cases. So um, I found them in, as I said, genetic databases, and I've been reaching out to, um, to the uh, testing centers and the, uh, the clinicians. Um, so far, I have not been successful to, uh, to, to find these cases that have been reported. Um, but if, yeah, if there are um, ways to do that, um, also through the community, that would be fantastic. Yeah. Okay. Because so I, just I, I really feel like we we will learn a lot from that. Yeah. So um, in in my lab, what we are doing is we we're using these molecular scissors to just kind of cut um, uh, alpha synuclein and kind of um, yeah model model this gene dosage um, in the lab in cell lines, and we started with lines with uh, with four copies, so the triplication. And then we sequentially knocked out, um, used the kind of cut off um, pieces of alpha synuclein from four copies to three to two to one to zero copies um, to really mimic um, this, this spectrum. Um, thanks to the Mike J. Fox Foundation, they funded that. And uh, we're now testing these cells also in animal models and want to see if. Um, if, if we can see some, some signs of um, molecular changes um, related to autism. Yeah, but it would be really, really useful to also have the corresponding uh, clinical cases. Oh yeah, it would be fantastic. And just, so just to clarify, uh, because probably I, I um, jumped to a conclusion here. Um, everyone with autism, does not have low alpha synuclein, correct? That's a, that's another good question. So, um, um, so there have been very few studies because that's of course not not the typical link. Yeah, that you're, yeah. I mean, you look at neurodegeneration and neurodevelopment, and whenever I write in um, in a a grand application I want to study neurodevelopment with alpha synuclein everyone starts laughing yeah mm -hmm. um, they're just not there yet so um, making that connection is um, is a challenge and um, yeah so that's 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 where we are basically okay so the answer is we don't know if everyone with alpha synuclein or i'm sorry everyone with autism has low alpha synuclein there is um <clears throat> there are a couple of there are a couple of papers um that has yeah taken blood samples from from autistic uh, children and they've actually seen a little lower expression of synuclein and um an increase in um, it's called an isoform, a, a protein that looks very similar to alpha synuclein. It's called beta synuclein, so it's basically a, a sibling of alpha synuclein, yeah? and um, and has uh, has seen um, compensatory increases of beta mm. synuclein in these children. Mm. Um, it's an interesting. I mean, there, there are a couple of smaller studies. Um, it would be really important to kind of go deeper. 
and, uh, and, and study that. But again, yeah, yeah. That, that connection is, is, is hard to, to make. Yeah, right. Uh, we have, when attendee asks, do you have some suggested reading for us? Um, One thing I might suggest is uh, this webinar is being recorded and we should be able to post it to our support group's webpage probably by Friday, if not by Friday, then by next Monday. I would re recommend reviewing it again because I think it's a very clear, organized, a presentation of, uh, of DNA, RNA, genes, and these six strategies. And I, I think that's where I, if I wanted to try to learn more, I would repeat the webinar again. Yeah, and, and I'm happy to send out the references that I've used. Oh, um, okay. But, but but those are those are all um, scientific papers. Very I'm scientific. not sure if, if if that's too much. Um, yeah. But but I mean I yeah that's I'm I'm, I'm happy to to give it out, but it becomes very heavy. <laughs> yeah, with a with a nerd heavy nerd warning. <laughs> um, okay, I just wanted to return one last time, if I could, to that. Uh, question of secretion or transmission mm -hmm. do we know um and this might be completely outside of your wheelhouse but do we know from researching alpha synuclein whether it does you mentioned these extracellular secretions does it indeed transmit in the same way that a prion disease transmits <clears throat> yeah, that's not quite, uh, I, I don't think I can give you okay, okay. a, a very good. good answer there, but um, I do remember, and I have to go back, there has been um, really a recent paper, um, yeah, it, it, it goes a little, a little off um, that um, talks about nan nanotubes and nanotunnels. Um, yeah, there's a lot of research going on in this field. Um, I'm not that familiar. I don't want to say any, anything wrong. Yeah, that, that's perfectly fine. I think I don't know is a, is a quite a reasonable answer when it comes to a scientist and wanting to, <laughs> to always tell the truth and always stick with that. Um, all right, I think those were all the questions that I had. And if anybody else, we're almost out of time anyway, if anybody else has any last questions, just type them into the chat or the question box. And I don't see anything. So we will um, certainly post the recording. And uh, Dr. Shula, would you mind also sharing your slides? Oh, yeah, yeah, not, not a problem. I'll, I, I can send them to you. Sure. It's wonderful. We'll put them to a PDF and post the slides as well, along with the recording of the webinar. And we thank you so much, Dr. Shula, for a wonderful presentation. It was my of pleasure. Therapies. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye. Bye, -bye. Bye everyone.